Well, what is up, Substance? Make some noise wherever you are at. We are so blessed you are in church today. And if I could have everybody here at Northtown welcome everybody at downtown doing time delay today. Come on, give it up for them. We love you guys, and we are so blessed to be able to have, have church today. And really, I, I'm, I'm ultra excited to have you here today because we are in part four of our teaching series called Practical Miracles. You see, I, I believe that God wants to, to do miracles in our lives on a regular basis. And so what we've been doing over the past several weeks is really just studying the practical miracles of the Bible. And then just, just in case you've missed some of our other weeks, uh, as an example of a practical miracle... Uh, recently I was reading in, in 2 Kings chapter 6, and if you haven't read 2 Kings, it's really this, in this particular passage, it's the story of Elisha and his prophets, and they were doing a building project, and they were cutting down trees by the Jordan River, and all of a sudden, one of the guys, one of the, one of the construction workers, one of the carpenters, drops his axe in the river, and of course, you know, he shouted out, no, that was a borrowed axe. Don't you hate that? I mean, come on. You were too cheap to buy an axe in the first place, right? And so now, not only are you out an axe, but you could buy one, and you're still going to be out an axe. It's so irritating. And, of course, he shouts out, no, that was a borrowed axe. And, of course, uh, and, and so Elisha was like, hey, 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 just it's all good. It's all good. Don't worry. We're going to trust God. And then he just felt like God said, throw a stick in the spot of the river where you dropped it. And God is going to do something unique. I mean, how weird is that? And, of course, the moment he, so they threw a stick in that little part of the river. And somehow, against all odds, the iron axe had floated to the surface. And they grabbed it out of the water. And I, I just, okay, when I read that, I remember thinking to myself, okay, God, did you really need to whip out a miracle for a silly axe? I mean, really. I'm just saying, did, did you really have to, no, of course, even stranger, I, this, is, this is how I think, okay, even stranger, God, did he really need to throw a stick in the river where they dropped it? I mean, I, I think someday we're going to get to heaven and God's going to be like, uh, yeah, that stick thing, that was just like a test, it was just, I just, I was making it up, hey, let's have him throw a stick, you know what I'm saying? I, 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 don't, I don't get it, okay, there's, when you read certain miracles of the Bible, they don't always make sense, but I do believe that, that acts of faith make sense, even ones that don't always make sense to us. And I, I just, you have to understand, God did these types of miracles all the time. In John chapter 2, Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding. Did he have to do that? No, but he did. In Nehemiah, God took a three-year building project and made it happen in 52 days. In other words, he kind of sped up efficiency. Did he have to do it? No, but he did it. In Genesis 24, God supernaturally provided a good-looking spouse in a shortened timeline. And all the single people here today said amen. Okay, in 2 Kings chapter 4, God supernaturally canceled out poison. Come on, three different times in the Bible, God multiplied food. Couldn't he have just said, prepare more food, you know what I'm saying, in advance? No, he multiplied it. Two different times, Jesus caused the disciples' nets to overflow with fish. Or in 1 Kings 17, God caused a raven, a bird to bring Elijah a turkey sandwich. Come on. I mean, we, well, we don't know if it was actually Turkey, but seriously, okay, this is a practical God. This is a God who cares about all of the mundane details, which is why 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all of your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. He loves it when we trust God for practical miracles. It's, it's kind of a, a personal example of this. Uh, a few years ago, I was, I was just hanging out with a delightful Christian couple who had a... Uh, Keurig coffee machine. How many of you love coffee? Come on, somebody. Somebody loves coffee here at Substance. But, uh, so, and they had this, this Keurig coffee machine, and, uh, and they're like, yeah, but it's such a bummer. It's broken. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, the, the water pump doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't intake water after you do it anymore. And, and so it's kind of just junked out, and, and they were kind of depressed about it. And, of course, so while we were standing there, I, I just happened to tell them the story, uh, the same one that I shared in a message two weeks ago about how I, how I laid hands on my CD player and God healed it. And so I, I told them that story, and then we were, they were all kind of laughing, like, that's crazy. And then they were like, well, well, Pastor Peter, would you lay hands on our Keurig coffee machine? Maybe he'll heal it. And I'm like, 
you know, I kind of gave a nervous laugh, like, <laughs> okay, you know, like, uh, sure, okay. So we laid hands on it, and uh, I'm like, God, you can do anything. Lord, you care about coffee? <laughs> I don't know if he really does. But uh, I, I'm like, God, I really believe that you can actually heal this, and, and I, I pray that you would right now. And after we all said amen, we were like, okay, let's turn it on and try it out. And sure enough, Jehovah Java showed up, man. I'm just saying, we all had coffee that night, and it was awesome. And I, I, I started thinking, dude, I should open up a healing shop for broken appliances. You know what I mean? I just lay hands on refrigerators, and they fall out under the power of God. You know what I'm saying? Like, I thought, well, let's do this. This can save a lot of people money. But, I, okay, now let me, let me just cut to the chase because I know what some of you are thinking. Well, why hasn't God healed my piece of junk car? You know what I'm saying? Or, or whatever it is you're waiting for, okay? I think all of us have miracles that we're waiting for. And I, I, I think whenever we have an unanswered prayer or whenever we had something that didn't turn out the way that we were hoping and praying, it, it has this tendency to kind of uh, get under our skin and undermine our faith. And obviously, if you were here the last three weeks, I've been giving all sorts of biblical reasons for unanswered prayer, biblical reasons for delay. I've been delays. I've been trying to stimulate your, your faith for miracles, but I've also been trying to uh, give you a little bit more of a theological foundation for what is happening when God doesn't necessarily show up the way we want. And I, I wanted to give you one more reason uh, this week, and, and I want to quote the Apostle Peter out of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. 1 Peter 1, 6 says this. The Apostle Peter explains why things go on sometimes, that, that miracles don't always happen the way we want. And he says this, 1 Peter 1, 6, for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. In other words, he's saying, listen, just because we're Christians doesn't mean we're going to have a, a, a pain-free life. He's saying you're going to have different trials. Of course, Jesus said it this way, in this world you'll have many trials, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And, and Peter is kind of saying the same thing. Hey, you, for a, for, you have a, there's a little season. For a season, you're going to have to suffer grief in different trials. But verse 7, here's why. These trials have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. In other words, what the Apostle Peter is saying here is your faith is the most important asset that you have, the, the most important. It, more, more than gold. It's, it's more than money, more than anything else. Quick victories, they're nice, okay? Instant miracles, they're cool. They've got value. And if you walk with God long enough, you're going to see some instant miracles. But persevering faith. Now, that is the ultimate thing. And it's not just part of your life. It's the foundation of your life. It's the engine of the car. It's the gun that fires the bullet. It's the all-access pass to heaven. And if you could just build that faith muscle to the level that God is calling you, that your temporary circumstances or momentary trials won't even shake you anymore. Why? Because you know that God always is working together for the good of those who love him. Romans 8, 28. That's what we can know that deep in our heart. And, and I, I always tell people, you know, the main purpose of prayer is not so that we can kind of whine at God our prayer lists. And yet, for many of us, that's kind of how we do it. We, it's, you know, we, prayer is the, the way that we just kind of gripe about all the circumstantial irritations in our lives. But I, I want to just continue to recommunicate. The real purpose of prayer is to commune with God so frequently, so often, and to build our faith up in his presence so consistently consistently that we don't even feel the need to beg God for circumstantial things because we're so convinced that he's already going to take care of things. Does that make sense? So really the purpose of prayer is surrendering to God to the point where we're living in continual peace. And let me tell you something, you can have that even in an election year. What? Like, I'm just saying, I, you know, like, you just, every single time I watch the news, you can see there's so many people whose God is, they put their faith in man. 
And you can, you can tell they put their fa- – like every single year whenever the election happens, there's all these suicides that occur because people – like it's the end of their world. All their hope has been shattered because they put faith in men, not in God. And my whole point here today is don't put faith in any earthly circumstance. Put your faith in God. This temporary blip of a life is nothing more than a test for an eternal earth that God is going to create, and it's going to be perfect. And, and yet I, I realize that sometimes in the midst of waiting moments when, you know, these delays between promise and power, they can feel excruciating when, you know, when you're trusting God for physical healing or when you have a family member who's really struggling. But I, I'm telling you, God has a silver lining, and it doesn't always make sense, but it will happen. You know, a while back I, I heard a story from a pastor by the name of Jim Simbola. And he, he pastors a church in New York City, and he, he did an interview with, with Leadership Magazine a while back that totally impacted me. And I, I just wanted to read a quick little excerpt from the article that he did. Uh, and so Pastor Jim Simbel is telling the story of his daughter, and I just feel like the Lord is going to speak to some of you as I share this, this testimony from this pastor. Uh, pastor Simbel said, up until age 16, my oldest daughter was a model child, but she, then she got away from the Lord and got involved with a godless young man. She eventually moved out of our house and later became pregnant. We went through a dark tunnel for two and a half years, and all the while, wonderful things were happening at the church. We were renting Radio City Music Hall for large outreaches. We were starting other churches. My wife and our Brooklyn Tabernacle, Tabernacle Choir were making albums, and many were coming to Christ. And yet, no one knew in the middle of that season I was hanging on by a thread. I often cried the minute I left my house till I got to the church door thinking, how in the world am I going to make it through three meetings today? My daughter, my daughter. But I didn't want to make my needs the focus. People are coming to the church because of their needs. Many of them live in in ghettos, in violent, non-Christian homes. After Chrissy, my daughter, had been away for two years, I decided to spend some time away in Florida. I I prayed to God while I was there, God, I've been battling, I've been crying, I've been screaming, I've been arguing and maneuvering with Chrissy. But no more arguing, no more talking, it's just you and me. I'm just going to intercede for my daughter from now on. I told Carol, my wife, to stay in touch with our daughter because if I tried, I'd end up pushing her away even further. And so from this point on, I'm just going to pray instead of politic. How many of you know sometimes there comes a point where politics need to cease and prayer needs to increase? You know what I'm saying? There comes a point where carnal influence, earthly influence, words cease to bring about the result that we need, and we need to turn to something, a a power that's more divine, something that can affect our circumstances in a way that nothing else could. And so that's the exact situation he's in with his daughter. And he writes, I ended up staying in Florida, praying until I felt a breakthrough. And in the midst of that season, God brought me to a new realm of faith so that when I returned to New York, I stopped reacting as before to the discouraging things Chrissy did. Isn't that interesting? I think so many of us are stuck in a, in a, in a tough situation where all we do is we react. It's not a faith reaction. It's just an anxiety reaction. It's not a, God, you're going to take care of this kind of reaction. It's a, just a, it's a fear reaction. And, and so he got to that point where he stopped reacting. He says, I found a place in God where I could praise him, even though the news from her was getting worse. Which is a hard thing to describe. It, it wasn't positive thinking, it was faith. Four months later, in February, we were in our Tuesday night prayer meeting, and the choir and the church leadership now knew about my daughter, but we didn't spread the news any further in the church. I had not talked to my daughter since last November. Suddenly, an usher in the midst of this prayer meeting passed me a note from a young woman in the church, a person that I felt was a pretty spiritually mature person, uh, Pastor Simbola, she wrote, I feel deeply impressed that we are to stop the meeting and pray for your daughter. After reading it, I thought, Lord, is this really you? I mean, I I prayed within myself. I don't want to make myself the focus here. 
But at that moment, Chrissy was at a friend's house somewhere in Brooklyn with her baby. And I, I interrupted the meeting, and, and I had everyone stand. And I, I didn't even know how else to say it. And so I just confessed it to our leaders. Guys, uh, my daughter thinks up is down, white is black, black is white. And I said, somebody sent me a note saying that she feels impressed that we're supposed to pray for her. And, and I take this as being from the Lord. And, and so all of the leaders of the church joined me. And, and people truly started praying. Uh, in fact, the room started to feel like a labor room at a hospital. Uh, people started calling out to God with incredible intensity. And, and when I got home later that night, I just said to my wife, who wasn't at the prayer meeting, I'm like, it's over. And what's over, Carol said. It, it's over with Chrissy, I replied. I, you had to be there tonight. I just, I just know that when we went to the throne of God's grace, something happened in heavenly places, and it's over. It's over. It's done. 36 hours later, I was standing in the bathroom shaving, and my wife burst into the bathroom. Chrissy's here. Chrissy's here. You, you, you better go downstairs. I, I don't know. I said, after having intentionally kept my distance from Chrissy for four months, trust me, trust me, go downstairs. And so I wiped the shaving cream off my face. I went down into the kitchen, and there was my daughter, 19 years old, on her knees weeping. She grabbed my leg and said, Daddy, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against myself. Daddy, Daddy, who was praying on Tuesday night? Uh, what do you mean? Like, what, what happened, I said. Well, I, I was sleeping, she said, and God woke me up in the middle of the night, and he showed me I was heading towards this pit, this, this chasm, and, and Daddy, I got so afraid. I suddenly saw myself for what I am, but then God showed me that he had not given up on me, and I looked at my daughter, and I saw the face of the daughter that we had raised, not, not the hardened face of the last few years. And after that time, everything changed. Chrissy and our granddaughter moved back into our house, and that was three years ago. Today, she's directing the music program at a Bible school, and she was married this past year from a man to a man from our church. Now, listen to me, loved ones. Your life may not... what be what you want it to be today. Your family, your relationships may not be what you want them to be. But if you're wondering if God can transform your world through prayer, he can. He can. He can transform your spouse. He can transform your child. He can transform your parent, your coworker, even your boss. Some of you are like, no, you don't know my boss. You have no idea. Listen, I'm telling you, God can radically alter people's lives. It really just comes down to us being willing to trust him for it. And for some of us, I think, I think some of us, we've got faith in certain areas of our lives, but we lack faith in other areas of our lives. And, and we just just for one reason or another, faith is like leaky fuel in certain areas of our lives. But I'm telling you today, I don't know what that area of, of unbelief is for you today, but I just believe that God wants to call you to a lifestyle of faith. And just what is that right now? Just, just close your eyes just for a second. And just what is that anxiety that's weighing on you right now? And maybe maybe it's a, it's a certain person, a relationship, or maybe... Maybe it's your job situation. Maybe it's your, your something going on in your finances or your physical body. And you're just, you're out of faith right now. You're just kind of at the tail end of, 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 you're down to that last little bit. What is that area? You see, I believe that God brought you to church today because he wants to target that area. He wants to stimulate your faith in some particular way. So, so look up here for a second. I, I wish I could just stop each one of you and just tell you, listen, God loves you. He loves you so much. And, and listen, God's love, you, you can't see God's love as conditioned upon our timelines for things. Because sometimes God doesn't always do what we want in the timeline that we want. But if we could just see things from God's perspective, I believe that God would just want to grab you today and just say, hey, listen, would you trust me? Would you trust me through the pain? Would you trust me through the grieving? Would you trust me through through the waiting moments to be working uh, a greater 
plan, a greater picture that you may not have understood before. You see, God can transform our lives through prayer. We just have to be willing to just rise up, take whatever little bit of faith we got, faith as small as a mustard seed, and just say, God, I'm going to trust you again with that circumstance. And God can take that, however small little bit of faith, and he can multiply it into something beautiful. I, I love what the Apostle Paul wrote. In 2 Corinthians, he was having one of the worst years of his life. In fact, his, his year was so bad that he actually said uh, he, he was despairing of life itself. That so bad they were despairing of life. He, he, was, he felt suicidal. It's just a fancy way of saying it was that bad of a year. And so in 1 Corinthians 1.9, he shared what God was doing in his life. As he was looking back on the year that he had, he said this. Second, it says this, 2 Corinthians, sorry. Not first, but 2 Corinthians 1 verse 9, he says this. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened, he writes, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Let me repeat that. This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. I believe that certain things happen in our lives for this very purpose, that that God would actually change our reliance. Now, why would God do that? Well, because God ultimately wants you to experience heaven. God wants you not just heaven in heaven on the new earth that he's going to create, but but right now I believe that God wants us to start experiencing deposits of heaven right here and now, and he's got to change the way we live our lives. We all love to imagine ourselves as having faith, but you know how you know if you have faith? Testing. And most of us, we, we like, a lot of our faith, it's theoretical until the moment something bad goes on. And I, I look at a lot of Christians, they're all, they're all happy when things are going good. It's all praise God and everything is awesome and God is good when everything's happening. But then the moment one thing happens, all of a sudden, where's God? I don't even believe in God. And they start blaming God and they get all weird. Their, 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 their shaky little theological foundation all of a sudden gets rocked. And, and next thing you know, they're not even going to go to church and they're self-medicating with all sorts of other things, the things that they truly trust in. You see, God loves us so much that sometimes he doesn't always answer our prayers because he's actually working on something bigger than that, than our circumstantial happiness. He's working on our faith, our reliance. In other words, Paul says this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. In other words, God was drawing us to himself. And, and church, I think this is really profound because I really believe that there's, there's some of you here today where you're trusting God for a breakthrough and because it isn't happening, your, your thinking is going crazy. But, but listen to how Paul got out of this funk. Listen to this, okay? In the following verse, I love this. 1 Corinthians 1.10, he said, or 2 Corinthians 1.10, it says, on God, we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read the Bible, I space out and I missed everything that I just read. Have you ever been there? Anybody? Come on, just confess it. Okay, especially when you're, when you're reading the Apostle Paul, it can be extra hard because it's, it's hard to translate him out of Greek. If you study Greek, um, it doesn't have like punctuation the same way English does. And so a lot of times it's translated as like a never-ending run-on sentence. And, and, and because of that, it just sounds like flowery poetry. Okay, so let me just, let me say that again, okay? On God, we have set our hope, the Apostle Paul says. And, and why? Because that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then... Many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted to us in answer to the prayers of many. Did you catch that last line? Gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. How does gracious favor come? It comes in answer to prayer, and not just prayers, but prayers of many. If you want gracious favor in your life, you need to get prayer kicking, and not just prayer from one person. You need to get it from the prayers 
of many. That's, that's how Paul got his hope. That's how he got out of his funk. That's how he got out of his suicidal season is he got humble with a bunch of people and he got gracious favor kicking in his life. And I don't know about you, but what would gracious favor look like for you? What would gracious favor look like in your finances, in your physical body, in your family, in your workplace situation? Listen, isolation, I believe isolation is one of the greatest barriers to the miraculous. And for some of you, uh, some of you today, I believe that your delayed miracle isn't just so that God would draw you to himself, but it's so that God would draw you to his church, to the men and women of God who want to carry you through your pain. And I, I, l- listen, I don't know why God always delays or why God often delays certain things, but I do believe that God has daily bread. He's got daily grace for us when we draw near and trust him again. And I I know it sounds kind of obvious about church attendance, but there is a huge, huge difference. Like as a pastor, I've been doing this for a couple decades, and I've seen I've seen a huge difference between families who are completely planted in the house of God versus uh, families that just kind of spectate. They just kind of show up. There is a huge difference between families who everybody in a fa- everybody in that in that family has a ministry that charges them up versus people that they're just they're just spectators. This is just kind of a little add on to bless them once a week. There's a huge difference. You see, the Bible says Psalm 92: "Planted in the house of God, you will flourish." Planted. In other words, your roots go deep, your connections go deep, and and, and there's a connection between miracles and rootedness. And that's really what the Apostle Paul is saying is that sometimes God is drawing us to himself and drawing us to his church. And if we could just figure that out in advance, I'm telling you, some of us are going to have a much smoother ride. And that's what I want for you. I want you to have a smoother ride. I believe that there's more miracles. And I just even think about the past couple weeks, church, we've had more miracle stories come in. Uh, from for, in our church in the last couple of weeks than I think we've had in the last couple of years. It's really been incredible. Uh, people just keep emailing us the most incredible stories uh, of, of, of divine healing, people that have just had dramatic, I mean, even, even practical things. One guy got, it, his phone got healed. Come on, somebody. Come on, God will heal. Meta- Some of you are like, come on. We've talked about CD players, coffee makers, cars. We've talked about, you know, phones. We've talked about physical bodies. We've talked about blind eyes. We've talked about family members. Like we, we've been, I've been trying to hit every possible issue so that you might have a, just a little extra faith. And so what was that area uh, that you were struggling in earlier? What was that area? What was that, that thing that you, you brought before the Lord that came to mind earlier? Let's just take that before the Lord right now. And we're just going to end by trusting God for that area. We're going to end just by interceding over that thing. So would you do that wherever you're at? If you're in downtown or watching online, I, want, I just want you to take that little burden that you're carrying right now, that little anxiety, and I want you just to lay that down before God. And I just want you to get to the point where you feel his peace. We call that praying through. Praying through. Praying through is just an expression we use to, to pray, pray until you feel the peace of God flowing in your life. And I'm telling you, if you could just even stop and do that right here in this moment, some of you, you're, you're going to feel that same release that even Pastor Jim Simbola felt, that, that, that other people have felt throughout, throughout church history when they had that burden. God wants to bring us to a place of perfect peace. So right now, Heavenly Father, you see everybody here today. You see everybody watching online. And you know what we need even before we ask, Matthew 6, 8 said. And you said that you would provide all that we need according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4, 19. And so, Father, we just acknowledge that's who you are, that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. And we take our burdens, we take our family members, our finances, our physical bodies, and we lay them down before you. And we just, we trust you for an instantaneous miracle, but even if you do not, we will not waver in unbelief. But we will be strengthened in our faith and we'll give full glory to you, knowing that you are able to do everything that we ask. In Jesus' name name we pray in, in church if that's your prayer i'm telling you some of you right now that the angels are on new assignments 
as a result of this moment. And maybe you're here today and you're new to this whole God thing. Maybe you're like, you know, I don't even know if I believe fully in God. Listen, I don't know where you're at or maybe what's happened in the past, but I do believe that if you would just be willing to take whatever little faith you have and place it in God, I believe God is going to reveal himself to you in a, in a unique and powerful way. And so would you just, if I could just end with a, a short little repeat after me prayer, maybe if you're, if you're new to this whole God thing and you just want to give your life over to Christ, let's just surrender right now. And I believe some of you are going to experience that breakthrough as a result of this moment. Just, just say this after me. Say, dear Jesus. I give my life to you. I ask for your forgiveness and your revelation to meet me now. In your name I pray. Amen. Right there. Right there. Salvation just came into some of your lives. And, and, and maybe you've already given your life to Christ and God is just pulling you deeper into his church. I just encourage you, just pray those types of prayers every single day. And you're going to feel that peace that God intends you to live with. Amen? With that, right now what we're going to do is we're going to turn it over to our campus pastors who are going to tell us where we're going to go next. I love you guys. We'll see you this next weekend. Thanks for watching this message from Substance Church. If Substance is your home or you want to partner with us to support the work that God is doing through this ministry, then you can take advantage of our online giving option. Just go to substancechurch.com and click on the Give Now tab in the upper right hand corner. This is a quick and simple way to support all that we're doing here. God bless and we'll see you next week.